So our title for this evening's webinar is Supporting Teenagers to Make Informed Decisions About Drug and Alcohol Use and Limit Negative Consequences. So we're going to work to provide you with some information to start that conversation, conversation with your teenagers about e-cigarettes, drugs and alcohol. You're going to gain an understanding of the many reasons that young people will experiment with substances and learn a little bit about maybe how you can support your teenager to make informed choices about substance misuse. We know that having conversations about substance misuse or use will help teenagers to be prepared for some of the potential harms or risks that are associated um, and figure out how they can keep themselves safe. So over the next 50 minutes or so, like I said, um, we are going to cover some key points. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about adolescent brain development. Then we're going to move on and talk, like I said, about why we are talking about teenagers using substances. We're going to focus on three main topics, so alcohol, drugs and e-cigarettes. We're going to talk a little bit then about why. So what are the reasons? What do we know? What's the research telling us about why teenagers do use substances? We're going to focus a little bit then on the risks, followed by thinking about resilience and that as a protective factor. And then we're going to talk a lot about, I suppose, how you as parents can help. What is your role here? Um, and what are some of the things that you can do to stay connected with your teenager and support them around this area? So we know that the topics of alcohol, drugs and e-cigarettes are huge by themselves. So we have tried to squeeze as much information as we can in here um, over the next hour. Um, so hopefully you will find it really useful. So if you've joined us for previous webinars, you might remember that we've talked about adolescent development, I suppose, in a broad way. So we've talked about their physical development, their emotional development, their cognitive development and other areas as well. For the purpose of this evening, we're going to focus that a little bit more and we're going to talk about adolescent brain development. So I suppose this isn't always something that we think about when we think about what changes are happening for our teenager, how their bodies are changing, what's going on for them. But in regard to the issue of substance use, it is really important that we think a little bit about this and we learn a little bit about it um, because it is exceptionally important. So children's brains have a massive growth spurt when they're very, very young. So by the time they're about six, their brains have developed to about 90 to 95% of their adult brain size. So they've done that much growth in the first six years. But it does still need a lot of growth and remodeling before it can function as well as the adult brain. And we know, the research tells us, that that remodeling that happens actually mostly takes place during those adolescent years. So it happens intensively in the adolescent years and continues right up until your child is in their mid twenties. So that's really important for us to remember that their brain is developing and continues to develop right up until they're in their mid twenties. So the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for impulse control, reasoned thinking, good judgment, the ability to plan, think about consequences, solve problems, that is the part of the brain that develops last. Again, that is something for us to remember. So it's this sequence of brain development then, so with the prefrontal cortex developing last, that maybe helps to explain some of the common traits of teen behavior that we see sometimes. So difficulty controlling emotions, seeking kind of high excitement and activities, inadequate planning, limited judgment, maybe taking risks and more impulsive behaviors. So some of those behaviors would be what we would, I suppose, describe as some typical teenage behaviors. Um, and I suppose that makes sense now that we know that the part of the brain that is needed for those is the part that I suppose develops last. So the prefrontal cortex can also be known as one's voice of reason. And with that developing last, I suppose it's easier for us to understand why teens can be so driven by emotion, excitement and short term reward without thinking about maybe longer term consequences. But unfortunately, these developing brains 
are more susceptible than the brains of adults to damage from outside influences. So this means that substance use during the teenage years creates a more distinct risk for immediate and lasting harm. So now we know a little bit about how a teenager's brain develops. We also know that I suppose the brain is still developing into their early 20s and that there are significant risks associated by substance misuse during this time. So for this reason, I suppose it is really important for us as parents um, to be aware of that, to be educated and to not be afraid to talk about this topic. So we're talking about it because in Ireland, Despite the legal age for alcohol being 18 and drugs being illegal, the average, average age for those who do start to experiment with substances is around the age of 15. We know that teenagers and young people's attitudes to alcohol and other drugs are influenced by many things. They're influenced by friends, by social media, by advertising, and not least, I suppose, the Irish drinking culture. So our teenagers are contending with lots of outside influences when it comes to this issue of substance use um, and substance, you know, being around them um, and in their peer groups and things. So there's lots and lots of influences. But fortunately, what we do know is that in spite of these many, many influences, parents remain the single strongest influence on your child's substance use behaviour. I'm just going to say that again. So parents remain the single strongest influence on the child's substance use behaviour. So it's really, really important for us to know and to remember and to keep in our mind. So that is telling us that we have a job here. You know, we have a role to play um, and we can support um, and help our teenagers as they navigate their way through this area. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about alcohol. So adolescence is often a time when many kids are introduced to and will decide whether to experiment with chemicals. So alcohol, an accessible and socially sanctioned drug is one of those chemicals. At some point, our children will have to decide whether to use or abstain. It is that prevalent. So I suppose alcohol is often one of the first, I suppose, easier to get to substances for teenagers um, because it, it is legal for adults to consume and it is sometimes consumed in the presence of teenagers or they see it being consumed. It then I suppose easy accessible for them and it can sometimes be seen as something safe to experiment with or to try but we know I suppose that that's not actually the case. So just to give you some facts, um, in 2019, there's a European schools project on alcohol and other drugs. So that's ESPAD that you see there. Um, so that was a study that was carried out in 2019 with just under about 100,000 students aged between 15 and 16 across 35 European countries. So it's a huge study. And that reports that 73% of school children in Ireland have drank alcohol at least once by the time they are 16 years old. So 73% by the time they are 16. Um, Manute carried out a study. Um, it was a study with third year secondary school students. And that reported, that was in 2021, and that reported that 57% first consumed alcohol in their own home or in someone else's home. And just one in four reported that they got in trouble with their parents for drinking or consuming alcohol. The same study reports that 44% of third year secondary school students cited tolerant parental views regarding their alcohol consumption. So these are 15 to 16 year olds and 44% of them cited that there was tolerant parental views regarding their alcohol consumption. Um, in 2018, NUIG carried out a study um, and it was between 12 and 17 year olds and that reported that the most common source of alcohol for those young people was from parents, guardian or a friend. So that I suppose just tells us a little bit about 
the prevalence and the accessibility to alcohol that our teenagers can have sometimes. But what is the law regarding alcohol? Because there is legalities around it. So it is illegal to sell alcohol to anyone under the age of 18. It is also illegal to purchase alcohol for anyone under the age, under the age of 18 or to purchase alcohol on behalf of someone. It is illegal for anyone under the age of 18 to consume alcohol in public places. But it is not illegal for under 18s to consume alcohol. So that's the significant difference. So it is illegal for them to, for them to consume alcohol in public places, but it's not actually illegal for them to consume alcohol. And it is this significant difference that causes confusion and anxiety for parents as parents are often unsure what approach to take when the question of alcohol consumption then is raised by their teenager. So, you know, parents are torn around, do we stick with them not being allowed to consume, consume alcohol until they're legally allowed to purchase alcohol for themselves, which is at the age of 18? Or, you know, some parents wonder, should they allow their child to consume alcohol under their supervision when they're under 18? So it is a massive dilemma um, for parents in that regard. As we move through the rest of this webinar and as we talk a little bit later about risks and um, that might help you as parents, I suppose, with regards to that and um, with that dilemma that you face with regards to, you know, when is the right time for young people to have access to alcohol. The effects then. So alcohol is a mood changing drug. And for this reason alone, it is unsuitable for consumption by teenagers. So we know that it is a mood altering drug. Due to their youth and their immaturity, a very small amount of alcohol can have serious consequences, both physically and mentally for young people. And I suppose a popular part of teenage drinking culture is binge drinking. So that's drinking large quantities of alcohol in a very short period of time. Um, and there is really serious risks um, with that behavior, I suppose. And one of them is alcohol poisoning. And we are going to talk in more detail um, a little bit later in the webinar. Um, once we've covered the topics of drugs and e-cigarettes as well, we'll do kind of a a full piece on the risk. So we're going to come back to those a little bit later on. So with regards to drugs then, so substance misuse is one of the most common and preventable risks to a young person's health and development. Drugs have well-known generic names such as cannabis, ecstasy, cocaine, but they also are known by a variety, a huge variety of other slang names, which parents are often unfamiliar with or unaware of. And those slang names or terms can change all the time. They can change from area to area, from groups. And um, so it is really, really hard. And, um, you know, even the drugs services who are working in this area all the time would say that it is a challenge to keep up with the various different names and terms that are used. But we do know that cannabis is the illegal drug most used by young people. But there is also a long and again, ever changing list of pills, powders, liquids and other substances that are taken into the body by young people using a variety of different methods, which can all have a variety of different effects. Again, we're just going to share some facts. Um, <clears throat> so the National Drug and Alcohol Survey is completed every four years in and in 2019 2020 it was done with just under 6,000 people in Ireland um, and that report is telling us that cannabis use in the 15 to 24 year old age bracket has increased from 11% in 2002 2003 to 14.5% in 2019 2020 so it's a, a gradual increase along the way. Um, the European study that we referred to back when we were talking a bit about alcohol, so that's the study of 15 to 16 year olds, 19% of those students um, reported that they had tried cannabis, with most having only tried it once or twice. So that study asked how many times in their lives young people had used cannabis, 
So just under 20% reported that they had ever tried it. Um, and it was a really sizable minority of students who were using it more regularly. So about 4% reported that they were using it more regularly, where it was the just under 20% that had tried it once or twice. And in the latest Growing Up in Ireland study, which um, some of the statistics were publicized in 2020, um, reports that 70% of 17 to 18 year olds reported that they have never used cannabis. So I think this is really, really interesting. And I think it's really helpful for us to hear. So 70% of 17 to 18 year olds have never used cannabis. And um, we can often hear quite kind of dramatic and sensational articles and headlines and stuff in the tabloids and in the media which I suppose would have us thinking that all teenagers are drinking and all teenagers are using drugs um, and have issues with drugs. However, the research and the really reliable research and the statistics are telling us something very, very different. Um, so I just think as parents, you know, it's really important for us to have that balance of information. Um, you know, we do know that young people do experiment with drugs and alcohol. Um, but it's really important that we have reliable information that is giving us that balance and, you know, letting us know that there's 70 percent of teenagers who have, have never tried cannabis. Um, and so I think that's really helpful for us to have in here as well. The effects of drugs. Um, so all drugs have the potential to cause harm. We know that they can act as stimulants, depressants or hallucinogenics, or they can be a combination of all three of these or they can have different effects on different individuals. Um, often young people don't know what, the, what they can act as when they're consuming them. They can make teenagers feel more energized, confident, relaxed, spaced out, slowed down, or they can bring on this kind of distorted perception of reality. They can be really, really harmful to both body and mind, and they can have a physical effect on the body, such as heart rate, organ function, temperature control, and then emotionally on mood and mental health as well. So overall, they can, we know that they can have, um, you know, really, really harmful effects. So e-cigarettes and vaping. So we're probably all aware of, I suppose, this new phenomenon um, of vaping and e-cigarettes, which our teenagers are not immune to and are certainly not protected from. Um, the use of e-cigarettes is unsafe for young people. Most e-cigarettes do contain nicotine, which we know is highly addictive and absolutely can harm adolescent brain development. Those brains that we know are still developing right up into their mid-20s. They produce an aerosol by heating a liquid that usually contains nicotine, flavorings, and other harmful chemicals that we don't actually know a huge amount about. And I suppose this is the thing with e-cigarettes and vaping, um, that there is still a whole world of research um, that needs to be done in regards to the, the impact or the effects of it, I suppose. Um, young people who use e-cigarettes may be more likely to smoke cigarettes in the future. And we do know that e-cigarette devices can and are also being used to deliver marijuana and other drugs as well. So there is that harmful element to it. Again, just to share some facts with you, like I said, um, there isn't a huge amount of research out there yet um, because it is something that I suppose society is still trying to get its head around um, because it is newish, but there is some information out there. So again, I'm looking at this European study um, and that is telling us that 39% of 15 to 16 year olds report that they had tried e-cigarettes. So that is 2019, so that is a while ago now. Um, so I would imagine that that statistic is different. Um, and 18% at that point would have considered themselves current users. Um, it is now illegal in Ireland to sell e-cigarettes to anyone under 18 years old because they do contain nicotine. And they must also contain warnings about the dangers of vaping on their packaging and things. Despite this, we do know that e-cigarettes appear to be relatively easy for teenagers to access. Um, we do know that social media is one of the most popular ways for them to obtain them. 
So they're using the likes of Snapchat and Instagram to buy and sell products between themselves. Um, the HSE did carry out a study in 2020 with transition year students. Um, and those TY students, you know, most of them stated that their parents hadn't actually discussed e-cigarettes with them, even though most had discussed smoking and the risks of smoking. Um, and the study found that a lot of parents didn't actually really know a huge amount about e-cigarettes or vaping in terms of their contents, the fact that they are addictive um, or the difference between smoking and vaping, because that, that information was just maybe not available. Um, so again, you know, talking about these topics and educating ourselves and finding out information is really, really helpful and is really beneficial for us as parents, but also for our teenagers. Um, so we do know that there has been a significant increase um, in the number of young people using e-cigarettes um, and the use of e-cigarettes is now more common than smoking cigarettes among young people among that age group. So that's just to give us kind of a sense, I suppose, of some of the facts that are out there. So this is where I'm going to ask you to engage with me using your chat, using your chat function, if you're able to locate it on the device that you're using. Um, so I just want us just to have a little think for a couple of minutes about why do you think teenagers use substances? So what is the reason? So maybe you have a teenager at home who has maybe experimented or tried substances and maybe you know the reason for that. Um, maybe you remember yourself what it was like to be a teenager and why you experimented with substances. Um, maybe you have younger teenagers and you've had to think about what might be some of the reasons. So it, it, you may just have a word or two, but just pop into the chat function. What do you think? So straight away, we have curiosity and peer pressure coming in there. Influence of friends to look cool addiction, see others, yeah, so adults having fun and using alcohol to fit in. Influence of friends is coming in there again, low self-esteem, curiosity. Living in the moment and not considering the future. They feel it gives them confidence. It's easy for them to get pressure from friends. Pick it to fit in, to forget their worries. So they have access to money, yeah. Feeling low, escapism. Okay. Peer pressure is coming in there again. So the influence of peers and peer pressure, influence of peers and peer pressure has come in a few times there. Okay. Thank you so much. So we can see even just from that, I suppose, a couple of seconds. So no fear of sanctions. Available when socialising, struggling with their identity. There's loads and loads of reasons coming in here. Great. Discussions at home. OK, so we can see even just from opening that up for just a minute or two. Um, that you're already kind of recognizing that there is maybe lots and lots of different reasons um, why young people experiment or why they're drawn to trying um, or using substances. So thank you so much for that. Um, so in this next slide, we're just going to talk about that um, a little bit more and what we actually know in relation to why. So this is going to be broken into kind of three areas. So we have social facilitation. Um, so I suppose that is young people telling us that, you know, using alcohol or using substances allows them to become become more confident, more friendly, more social, which is something that you already had in the chat. Um, getting drunk or being under the influence um, of substances kind of viewed as a coping mechanism or a, re a resource that they can use to overcome shyness or self-consciousness when they're in social groups. So that's a way to overcome it. And um, it makes it easier for them to meet people, make friends. The loss of inhibition, I suppose, 
um, allows young people to bypass kind of those normal room, normal interactions um, and feel that they can act a bit more freely. It helps with that sense of fitting in, which again, you mentioned, which is obviously so, so huge and important for teenagers in that age when they're really trying to figure out who they are and where they fit within their peer group and their friends. Um, and also kind of that sense of it gives them an increased confidence in relationships or sexual interactions. And um, they feel like they have a greater ability and confidence with approaching people or being around people where maybe they might normally feel a bit more self-conscious or shy. So that's that social facilitation piece. One of the reasons why teenagers use substances. Individual benefits then, so I suppose that's talking more, more about kind of that idea of, of escapism. So escaping or forgetting about problems. Um, so whether that's exam stress or relationship problems, breakups, feeling upset, lonely, distressed, family difficulties, whatever it might be. Um, again, it's seen as a mechanism um, or a resource that helps them to forget, um, to not think about stuff. Um, or also sometimes even people say that it's sometimes a way that makes it easier for them to share things. So again, I suppose that loss of inhibition or reduction in inhibition makes them feel like they can talk more freely or more openly um, about what's going on for them um, or what's bothering them. So the buzz, the excitement, that feeling of being carefree, the freedom, having a laugh, being a different person, being more outgoing. Um, and we know that, you know, alcohol and substances are often a huge feature in kind of celebrations, whether that's exam results times or graduations or ceremonies. Um, it's kind of really this rite of passage or this thing that is seen to be done. Um, and young people also report it as something to do. So boredom was a factor. And it's one of the reasons young people say that they do start you know, experimenting with drugs and alcohol because it is something to do and it's fun. Um, and then we have this idea of, I suppose, social norms and influences. So you already, a number of you mentioned in the chat function about peer influences. And we do talk a lot about peer pressure and the impact of peer relationships, but actually there's much bigger kind of social norms out there that we need to consider as well. So like wider social norms. So it is seen as a common pastime um, for people of equivalent age. Um, it's commonly believed that all young people at some stage, um, that it's like a natural transition. Um, it's something that's just habit. Um, and we know that within our society, it is something that's quite embedded in our social routines. Like I said, you know, if we think of major celebrations, um, whether they're, you know, christenings, weddings, um, Christmas time, graduations, whatever it might be, there is often, very often, um, an element of consumption of alcohol within those. Um, you know, there's family influences. Um, so within our households, what is the, the perceptions or the norms around substance use and alcohol? Um, and then there is, of course, peer influence. So the influence of siblings and friends, ranging from peer pressure to peer influence. Um, so young people talk about kind of feeling guilty that they're, they would be teased um, for maybe not drinking. They talk about not being able to handle it if everybody else is drunk or under the influence of alcohol so or under the influence of a substance. So it's better or easier just to keep up with the same level that they're at than be different. Um, and then there's kind of a, res a respect and image kind of area to it as well. So getting drunk is seen as forbidden. Um, so it's therefore associ associated with this certain image. You know, it makes them seem older or tougher or harder or whatever way you want to describe it. So it's like it's nearly a statement of rebellion. Um, and then if you don't drink or use substance, you're kind of considered a goody two shoes. So there's this sense of image. And we know that the idea of image and fitting in and belonging and being part of a group is so massive for teenagers and young people. Um, and if they're struggling with that in any way at all, you know, they can be more easily influenced if they don't feel confident within themselves. So I suppose sometimes we don't think about the reasons behind. Sometimes we just think about the behavior um, and it might be behavior that we're not happy about. Um, 
so sometimes it's good to just peel it back a little bit and think about actually what might be the reason that this is going on for my young person. Why are they doing this? Um, and that sometimes is, is a really healthy conversation that can happen. So we're going to move on now to talk, like I said, a little bit more about the risks. <clears throat> so we know that there can be immediate risks. So if young people are misusing substances, what might be the risk? So antisocial criminal behaviour, so vandalism, fighting, getting in trouble, things like that. Accidents and injuries are obviously a huge concern. Um, so if young people are out and they're under the influence or they're drunk, um, you know, they can end up hurting themselves um, or hurting others. Alcohol poisoning, drug overdose, um, getting a bad reaction to a substance is another risk. Um, risky sexualized behavior. So we talked about kind of that loss of inhibitions. Um, so young people might engage in risky behavior that they wouldn't normally. Poor school attendance or performance. So if young people are out and they're using substances at the weekend, it can make it very, very challenging to get back into the routine of school for the week. Um, you know, academically, it can impact on their performance. It can impact on their attendance because getting up on Monday morning might be a, a real struggle. Um, and that can lead into and be a part of relationship difficulties then. So, you know, if young people are struggling with going to school, that has a knock on impact to parent child relationships. You know, young people might also have difficulties, you know, in relationships with their peers and um, girlfriends, boyfriends, you know, or extended family if they're using or misusing substances. And we know then that there can also be kind of the mental health impact. So we know already from the information a couple of slides ago that alcohol is a mood altering substance. So, you know, it is a natural depressant. So if young people are using alcohol, you know, there, it would be reasonable to expect that maybe the next day, you know, when they're maybe not feeling so well, that they might be struggling a bit with low mood or anxiety and not feeling good about themselves. Um, so that is something for us to be mindful about as well. There are also some long term risks and um, that we need to think of as well. So learning difficulties, memory problems, concentration difficulties could all, all be a long term impact. Physical health conditions. So, you know, high blood pressure, heart disease, liver disease, you know, the, the list goes on and on in relation to the physical health conditions that can come about as a result of using substances um, long term. Alcohol and or drug dependence or addiction is could obviously be a long term risk. Um, regret and loss in, with regards to the future. So maybe having not advanced further, maybe with school or education or um, you know, not moving into the job that they or the career route that they had thought they might like to go down and um, maybe, you know, not pursuing college or an apprenticeship or, you know, not finishing that, whatever it might be, and um, that regret and loss that may come about from that. Anxiety and trauma from incidents. And um, so you know, we know that things can happen when people are under the influence of substances. We know that in the world of technology, things can be recorded and photographed and that can be shared widely on social media and all of the rest. So and that can cause massive, massive trauma and anxiety for people. Failed relationships. And um, so whether that's family relationships, parent child relationships, relationships with peers and um, relationships within education, work, whatever it might be. Um, and tied into that might also be kind of financial issues. So um, that can be a massive risk and concern for families. And we know that there can be serious mental health issues as a consequence of substance use as well. So, you know, it is really, really important that we talk about this topic. It's really important that we as parents are aware and educated. It's also really important that the young people in our lives are also aware and educated in relation to the risks um, from substance use as well. So there are the risks. On the opposite side, then we have, you know, the protective side. So what is a protective factor? 
And with regards to young people, one of the biggest protective factors is resilience. Um, but what is that? What, you know, what, what does that mean? So when we talk about building resilience in kids, I suppose, you know, parents know that it's about helping them to develop the knowledge, the confidence, the strength to resist adversity, to manage challenges, to overcome uncertainty and to recover and bounce back, I suppose, when things are hard or difficult or upsetting. So if they run into difficulty or if they make a bad decision or if they make a poor choice, that they're resilient, that with support and guidance and minding that they're able to kind of recover and bounce back from that and then make better choices going forward. Research has shown that children who are resilient are less likely to be involved in problem alcohol or other drug use. They tend to have better self-esteem, do better in school and have better relationships. So this idea of resilience as a protective factor is actually really, really key um, and important for us to think about when we're talking about the issue of substance use, because resilience could be one of the key factors in helping our young people manage this, you know, this difficult area of their teenage years. And the great thing to know is that it is possible for anyone to develop or boost their resilience. So it's not just something that is there and we can never change it. We can absolutely develop and boost it. And it is the quality of our relationships with others that is a critical factor in how resilient we are. So having meaningful and connected relationships with other people is what makes us human and it is essential to our mental health and well-being. But it is those meaningful connections and the quality of those relate those quality relationships that build our resilience. So there is things that we as parents can do to help boost the resilience within our children. And we're just going to go through some of the ways that we can support their resilience now. So the first box that you see coming up on your screen here is support, empathy and understanding. So we're in this space with teenagers where they're trying to become more independent. They're seeking more freedom from us. They're becoming more secretive. Um, there's maybe more distance between us than would have been previously. They're not needing us as much. But the reality is they absolutely still need our support, our empathy and our understanding. So it's trying your best to put yourself into their shoes. It's trying your best to understand what it is like for them. Sometimes it's helpful to, you know, think back to what it was like ourselves when we were teens and when we were younger. Yes, it was different, but there's still going to be lots of similarities. Um, so trying our best to really understand them and understand what it's like for them um, and support them with that. Presence and connection. Again, we may feel like they're at arm's length or they're more distant than they have ever been, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be present or at least try to be present um, and being physically being physically present for them is huge so you know maybe there's just an evening where instead of just dropping them off at training we actually stay and watch them training or maybe they isolate themselves in their bedroom to watch some to watch Netflix up there that they don't sit in the family sitting room anymore you know maybe you're able to pop in and just sit in the bedroom with them and have a chat in there instead, instead of expecting them to come down, maybe you're just able to check in with them up there. So it's that presence and connection that we want to try hold on to and build with them. So it's that listening ear. Belief in their strengths and their abilities. So it's still, you know, we talk about young kids thriving on praise, but, you know, our older kids do too. So it's praising them, acknowledging their achievements, their attainments, whatever that might be. So maybe that's that they attended school every day this week. Maybe it's that they got a really high mark in an exam. Maybe it's that they played really well in a match. And um, maybe it's that they were really kind to their younger sibling, whatever it might be. But it's having belief in their abilities and their strengths. Um. And, and praising them and acknowledging them and letting them see that you are noticing those. Trust and respect. Um, so we know that that's earned and we know that that works both ways. Um, but, it, but it's really important that we do, I suppose, allow them to spread their wings a little bit, allow them to go and make decisions 
because it is only from making decisions and making mistakes that they will learn. Um, so it's really important that we afford them those opportunities to problem solve, to decision make, um, to explore consequences and to consider opportunities. Because if we do all that for them, um, they're not learning those skills to take with them into their adult life. Acceptance. So accepting them where they're at and who they are. Um, so it's not expecting them to be different. It's not expecting them to change who they are. Um, so feeling accepted for who you are is, is crucial and really, really important. And that's where that, I suppose, inner confidence and self-belief um, comes from. Optimism and hopefulness. Um, so it's that idea, I suppose, that you know, it's okay to be hopeful, it's okay to be optimistic, and it's also okay to make mistakes. Um, and it's also, you know, important to remember that we will make mistakes, and but you can bounce back. Um, we will make mistakes and things might go wrong, but we can work our way through it and navigate our way back on track or on a different path. And um, so it's all about kind of problem solving and being optimistic and being hopeful and giving them that sense that there is an allowance and a space for making mistakes along the way. Being able to ask for help and being encouraged to ask for help. So it's a really important and valuable skill that we can give to our teenagers. If they're struggling, if they're not coping, if they're feeling under pressure, if they're in a difficult situation, letting them know that they can always ask for help. And, um, you know, maybe you have an agreement together that there is a code word. So if they're in a difficult situation where they're going to make a bad decision or just people around them making bad decisions, that maybe there's a text message with a word that they're able to send that is a kind of a get out clause for them. And um, so, you know, that by them sending you that message, they need to be maybe picked up or they need to get home, but that there's an agreement that there's not going to be, you know, a consequence to them doing that. So it's kind of like a, an amnesty clause, I suppose. Um, so it's important that they, that they know that they can come to you for help um, if that's needed. And that they have helped to understand their feelings. So we know that emotionally, with obviously the, the awareness and knowledge that we have about brain development, that they can be really, you know, having these massive big feelings and emotions going on that can be really hard for us as adults to understand, but for them as teenagers, really difficult to understand and get their heads around as well. So, you know, helping them to explore what they're actually feeling, how they are, what's going on for them, trying to name the feelings that they are having um, is really, really valuable as well. And when they're able to grasp that, um, that builds that resilience, it builds that self-confidence, it makes them feel better about themselves, it helps them to understand where they're at. Um, so it's all of these, I suppose, key skills that you as a parent can bring to that parent-child relationship. There's going to be loads of these things that you're already doing that are already part of your interactions um, and your relationship with your child. But maybe there's one small part of that that you're looking at and going, yeah, maybe I could do a little bit more of that. Or maybe that's something that I haven't done in a while. Um, so if you're going away with just one thing from today um, that you think can help build your young person's resilience, that's really, really helpful. But we know it's challenging for parents. <clears throat> um, we know that, you know, there, there is difficulties. We know that it's not easy. Um, so I want you to have a little listen here for just a couple of seconds to kind of what some parents say. So what are some of the challenges or the difficulties that we're hearing from parents? Some of these may resonate with you um, or you may be able to connect with some of them in some way. I will just alienate him from me or make our already fragile relationship worse by harping on about alcohol and his behaviour. I don't want to say anything in case it makes her think about it and makes her more curious to experiment. There is no point talking to him. He won't listen anyway. I don't know how to bring it up or what to say without sounding like I'm giving out or lecturing. If we say don't do something, he will just be more inclined to do it out of resistance or to rebel against us. It's too late to say anything now because I know she has already been drinking when she's out with her friends. So they're just some of the, the feelings that some parents have, some of the thoughts that some parents have when it comes to this issue of substance use um, and trying to 
get on a level with their teenagers or engage with their teenagers around it. Um, there can be a feeling of, you know, how do we go about it? What is the point? A relationship is already so strained and difficult that it's just going to make it worse. Um, so there's lots and lots of thoughts and feelings around it. Um, many of us struggle, you know, as parents, we struggle to know how to prepare our teenagers for challenges such as these um, and how to address it when it does start showing up in their life. We don't know exactly what to say, um, but we do know that having the conversation and staying connected with our teenager is crucial. Um, and, you know, the more we know, the more educated we are as parents, the more confident we as we are as parents talking about the topic, the better it will be for our teenagers. So what can you as parents do to help? So we have six steps. And like I said in the previous slide, there will be lots of these things that you are already doing. Um, but there may be a couple of things that you feel that you could give a little thought to or add into what you're already doing. So build a close relationship. So it's back to that connection. It's back to being present um, in whatever way you do that. It's trying to connect with them on a level that they are at. Yes, your relationship is different now to what it was when they were a smaller child, but that doesn't mean it's a negative thing. Um, it's a more adult-like relationship, um, but there's so much possibility there. Um, so it's about embracing it for the new relationship that it is um, and trying to build that closeness into it. Set boundaries and stick to them. Um, so this can be really, really challenging. But I suppose what we know is setting clear boundaries and rules about substance use helps give teenagers the structure that they need to stay safe. So when there's rules and boundaries that are clear and consistent, it provides a sense of safety and security. Teenagers know exactly where they stand. Now, we have to be realistic. We of course know that there is no guarantee that your rules won't be broken. Um, but the research does tell us that kids who have clear rules are less likely to get into serious trouble than kids who don't have any. And even when rules are broken, teenagers who's, who have parents that have clearly outlined what is and isn't acceptable are less likely to run into extremes and are more likely to make safer choices. So they're less likely to go to the extreme end um, of unsafe or risky behaviors. So having boundaries, even though maybe we know being realistic that they may be pushed or stretched or broken, having them there and being consistent and sticking with them is really, really valuable. Know what they are doing. So supervision is so important. And I know that it's hard because you're trying to do this balancing act of giving them freedom and giving them independence, allowing them to spread their wings. But we know that supervision is so, so key. So if they say that they're going to, you know, a friend's house or going somewhere, that we know where they are. Um, again, that's down to safety. Um, so talk to other parents. You know, don't be afraid to check in with other parents and say, oh, I hear the lads are, are hanging out in your place this evening or, they're, you know, you're picking them up or whatever. So it's really important that we know who they're with, know their peer group, invite their peer group into your house. If they're hanging out in your house, number one, you know where they are. And number two, you're getting an opportunity to observe what the dynamic is like, what the relationships are like. I know it might mean that your fridge is consistently empty because maybe you're feeding a load of young people. But that absolutely is a really, really great way to stay connected with your own teenager, but also to really see the type of young people that they're socializing with, what the dynamic is like, what the relationships are like. So that's a really, really good way to do that. Don't give alcohol under the age of 18. So we've talked already in the webinar about the various different risks. So our research very, very clearly tells us that the earlier young people get involved with alcohol and drugs, the greater the risks for them. So help them to avoid alcohol for as long as possible and encourage them obviously not to take drugs at all. Um, so that can be something that can be really, really challenging. 
um, and it can be something that teenagers will, you know, argue against with you. Um, I suppose you as the parent now have information to support your own decisions with regards to it, knowing the risks, knowing what we know about brain development, knowing the significant harm that be, that can be caused, you know, whilst the brain is still developing. If you're drinking, if you're using substances, you know, set a good example. So it's really important that we're responsible role models. So you, we talked about parents still being the single most significant influence. So that can be a positive or a negative. So you will influence your child's attitudes about alcohol and drugs well before they first experience them. So that's really important for us to remember. So if you have young children in your house, you are influencing their views and attitudes and beliefs around substance misuse now. They're not at the age where, you know, consuming or experimenting with substance is even on their agenda, but you are still influencing their views and beliefs around it. Um, and the same goes for, for teenagers. Um, so being that responsible role model is so, so important. And talk openly and honestly about the risks. So I said that already when we were on that piece of the, of the webinar. You know, it's important for us as adults and parents to know, but it is really important for our teenagers to know honestly what the risks are um, so that they know that information in advance of making choices. So there are six steps. <clears throat> so we just talked about boundaries and, and this is why, I suppose. Adolescence is a tricky time. So that's probably a bit of an understatement for some. Um, teenagers are just beginning to establish their identities. And this often means testing the limits of parental controls. When it comes to drugs and alcohol, pushing the boundaries can lead to dangerous territory. So with regards to this particular issue of drugs and alcohol, you know, not having boundaries in place is definitely dangerous territory. So we have a responsibility as parents to make sure that there is rules and boundaries regarding our teenagers um, in order to keep them safe. So talking to teenagers about alcohol and drugs. So no matter what our own apprehension is around talking to our children, it is so important that we talk to them in an honest, open and factual way. There is no point in us hiding away from this conversation because this is happening in their world. This is happening in their life. This is happening in their peer group. This is happening, you know, in their week at the weekends, whatever it might be, depending on their age. So us kind of sticking our head in the sand and just maybe ignoring it until it comes up is not a sensible way to approach it. It's really important that we're having these conversations. And if we wait until we're forced into action because of maybe alcohol misuse or the, you know, experimenting and having a bad experience, then the talk will be even more difficult because they're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be annoyed. There's going to be guilt. There's going to be remorse. There's going to be all these feelings going on. Whereas if we're starting the conversation really, really early on um, and having it as a kind of an ongoing dialogue, then it's much easier to do that. So start young. So start openly and start honestly and start young talking about it. Pick the right moment. So, you know, bringing it up when they're, you know, maybe frustrated about something else or doing it kind of when there's other people about to walk into the room or when they're just getting out of the car is maybe not the best approach. So if give it the time that it deserves. It's a really important topic in the life of your teenager. So, you know, afford it the time um, and the focus and the attention that it needs. So if you're really busy as a parent and you know that you've thrown out the door in 10 minutes to pick up a younger child or something, maybe that's not the right time either. You know, pick a time where you know you're able to actually switch off from everything else and put away the phone or whatever to do that. Be honest. So again, you know, giving them the factual information, being open and honest with them. Um, if we want honesty from our teenagers, we have to we have to be honest with them too. Um, listen, so make it a two way conversation, you know, encourage them to ask you questions. If you don't have the answer, if you don't have the answers, 
you know, figure out a way or talk about a way that maybe you could find out that information together. Maybe that's contacting a local service. Maybe that's looking it up online. Maybe that's doing a bit of research. Um, but definitely make it a two-way conversation that it's not just you with a narrative or a dialogue um, or a lecture, that it's, it is a conversation. And be realistic. So be realistic about the dangers. Be realistic about the age that your young person is at and what can be expected from them. Um, so be realistic. So there are just some tips, I suppose, for talking with, with your teenager. So when the parental duty of talking with our children is neglected for whatever reason, we and our children lose more than we gain. I think that's really important for us to remember. So if we neglect the conversation, then it's our children and us that are losing out. And that's not what any of us want. So we're just coming to the end of our webinar. Um, and I know we're just coming to the end of our time as well. And before we finish, I suppose we always just do a really small piece in relation to parental self-care because it's so, so important. Um, you will see here at the top of your screen, it says that being a perfect parent is impossible and attempting to be one can lead to exhaustion. There is no such thing as a perfect parent. Um, research suggests that whatever allows parents to recharge their batteries to avoid exhaustion is good for children. So whatever it is we use to recharge our own batteries is positive and good for our teenagers and our children. So it's about having a think. So what are your own beliefs and values around substances? So each parent comes with their own unique, I suppose, experiences and perspectives on the topic of substance and alcohol. Um, you know, it's about exploring that and thinking about that for yourself if you do use substances what are your reasons so is it something that you're using as a coping tool is it something that you're using to unwind and switch off and turn off from you know difficulties or challenges or stresses are you being a good role model for your teenager are you demonstrating good and healthy coping skills when maybe there's challenges or difficulties And then how do you take care of yourself as a parent? So what are the things that you do to fill up, I suppose, these quadrants in relation to your own health? So in relation to your mental health, spiritual health, social and physical. So what are the things you do? What are the supports that you have? What are the relationships that you can draw on? What are the connections you use? What are the hobbies and interests that you have? What refills your cup? What recharges your batteries? Sometimes as parents, when we're parenting and when things are tough, we neglect ourselves. Um, and that's not helpful because if we're not fully charged, then we're not able to give the best of ourselves to our young people. And sometimes they need the best of us. Sometimes things are tough for them um, and they need the best of us to help support and guide them. And if we're running on empty, we're not always able to do that. Um, so it is really, really important that we do think about ourselves in all of this. Um, and if we're struggling and if it's if we're finding things tough, it's back to what we talked about earlier, encouraging our young people to ask for help. We do that by letting them know that we also ask for help as parents and as adults and that we're not worried about doing that. So talk to other parents. Um, if it's something that's present in your family and in your life at the moment, you can guarantee it's in, you know, Johnny down the road who's in the same year in school. It's in his house as well as a conversation. So talk to other parents, bring up the topic. Um, if talking to other parents isn't an option, then, you know, reach out to professionals or services or people within school um, who are going to be able to support and help you as well. So we have some further supports. So if you've gotten to the end of the webinar this evening and you still have outstanding questions or you feel, you think that maybe your family needs a little bit of extra support, the Bernardo's Parent Support Line is available every day from 10 until 2. These supports that you see on the slide here, don't worry about taking them down because you are going to receive an email um, before the end of the week with a video recording of this webinar and also with all of these resources along with some other information from the webinar too. Um, 
when, once I move on to the next slide, the webinar will end quite quickly. And the reason it will do that is because we do have a very quick questionnaire at the end that we're asking people to fill in, just to give us a little bit of feedback around your thoughts on the webinar. Um, all the feedback is really, really important to us. And um, like I said, this is the sixth in the series of webinars by the ETB Schools National Parents Association. Um, there potentially will be more down the line. So any feedback we get helps us with regards to the design and development of that. So please do answer the really quick questions at the end. Um, I know we have flown through all of that information really, really quickly, and it may have been hard to take in. Um, so I hope you've managed to stay with me for most of it. Thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your evening. It has been a pleasure. Um, and we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you so much. <laughs>